Hi, this is Paul, and we have Burn Power back again. When I talked with Burn oh, a number of weeks ago, I knew that we'd have to talk again, and I've been yeah. watching Burn's channel. And see, here's, here's the nice thing about being old, that you've been around, and you've had a chance to read, and you've seen stuff. And so Burn and I, yeah. we're going to talk about all kinds of things. We're going to talk about – oh. Go ahead, Byrne. Let's start. Why don't you tell us a little free bit about free range conversation? Free, free range, range conversation. Yes, yes. No, but uh, um, no. I was just. I just wanted to mention. I just. I have two YouTube channels. One is the Anadromist. Sorry, I'm getting my own words mixed up. The Anadromist Life, and Anadromist is a word from biology, which means going against the stream. That's what salmon do. And the second one, the newest one, is called the Anadromist, and that is me. Uh, and, uh, that is more for me talking and I've just got way too much stuff in my head. I need to unspool. So I figured I, I you know, actually watching people like you, uh, I mean, I've just been seeing so many people talking and I said, I got to get in on this talk. Fest. <laughs> 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 and it just seemed like a good, I, I mean, I'd been working on these other YouTube videos, which are more like documents, but I said, man, let's, let's see what we got here. So. Okay, so what did you, you were well, going to... Francis Schaeffer, let's talk a little bit about Francis Schaeffer, because okay, part of... Let me ask you, go ahead. What, what's your impression of Francis Schaeffer and Labrie, uh, as far as, like, uh, how you've seen what they were, uh, what you might be seeing of, I mean, I know you've been bumping into more people who have claimed some sort of Labrie lineage, uh, how, how are you seeing that phenomena? And, and it's in, been in conjunction in some ways with the uh, Peterson phenomenon. So yeah. how are you seeing this? Well, so I bumped into you, Ron Dart spent time at Labrie, uh, Warren Mills, who's the guy who brought me to Australia, who wrote this little book. He and his wife Elaine mm -hmm. spent time at Labrie. I'm bumping into a whole bunch of people of your generation who spent time at Labrie, and I know, so in the 70s, I was a kid, all right? So that, I might be bald, I might be gray, but I was a kid in the 70s. And Yeah, you're uh, about 10 years younger than I am, yeah. or, or so. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm 1955, was, you're what, 1963? Yeah, so, so So I was, I was a kid when Francis Schaeffer hit my house and my father and my father's church, and I remember... Right. Because as a kid, you know, you just see these books come through the house. My parents were book lovers. They were always reading. And so these Francis Schaeffer books start coming through. And I just hear my father talking about Francis Schaeffer with some of his friends and some of the people at church. And everyone was all excited about Francis Schaeffer. And, and my sense was that there was a moment where Francis Schaeffer and Labrie in Switzerland, this was, a, this, was, this was the place to go and the thing to do. And mm -hmm. then... In my household, because we were, you know, basically in an African-American community, an African-American right. church, once the culture war hit in the 80s, Francis Schaefer was gone, you know, right. because Francis Schaefer, and if you listen to Frankie Schaefer on, his, on some of his YouTube talks, you know, then they got into the whole Jerry Falwell thing, flying around, the abortion issue, all of this stuff. So Francis Schaeffer disappeared, and Francis Schaeffer went from being a, a really cool place that young Christians who wanted to explore Christ and culture and all of this stuff suddenly became American religious right culture war stuff. And then, of course, the, with, the, with the second coming of, or the first, you know, the second coming of Frankie Schaeffer, who makes a career writing, in a sense, a, a number of things, but tell all books about the weirdness of Labrie and his father mm -hmm. and his mother and how he discards you know, this. And then he's, he has, you know, intriguing talks where he's both an atheist and a Christian and he joins the Orthodox Church. So it, there's just a whole lot of weirdness about this. And then again, when I started the Jordan Peterson thing, Francis Schaeffer Jeff kept coming up and I kept bumping into people like you who mm -hmm. were part of that early that those early pilgrimages to Labrie. And so I'm very curious about that, especially with respect to why am I getting echoes of this with the Jordan Peterson conversation? Right, right. Yeah. Well, um, 
So you, why you did you go to Labrie? Oh, well, that's a, <laughs> that's where the big story starts and I'm not going to go all the way into it, but uh, <laughs> essentially I had been in, in 1970 at the age of 15, I had joined what turns out to be one of the ground zero Jesus people groups of the Jesus movement and uh, ended up uh, right out of high school living on a farm commune. Um, the Jesus people eventually started to tighten up and uh, the group we were part of eventually became kind of culty. And the reason for that was because we were drifting and we were looking for a way to bring order into our chaos. Uh, and I could go into that. This is where the story gets huge. Anyway, I, meanwhile, had discovered literature and was reading. I, I was starting, I made a couple attempts to start university around that time. And I spent a year between high school and university, um, uh, uh, rather between high school. Yeah, I took a year, you know, my, my uh, year off. And, and then when I went back, I'd seen so much craziness on these farm communes and stuff that when I went back, school already seemed just completely unreal to me. And I remember, well, I don't want to go into it all, but it just seemed rather pointless almost. And so what I did is I dedicated myself to start learning on my own. And so I, if you were to see me walking around the streets in those days, I might be, I don't know, reading uh, Moby Dick, walking around, like uh, just walking and reading. Because <laughs> I was just so like trying to read as much as possible. Um, of course, Books I read used to be uh, cell phones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, before then, I was really good at navigating, though. So I no problem. Never bumped into anyone with my books. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> never read while I was driving. So, um, uh, but no. Um, what it was was I started to get the feeling the group at the beginning was more open to ideas. I would say politically, we were neither left nor right. And, um, but we eventually started drifting more to the right. And I started seeing some of those early meetings where people were talking about praying for the country. Uh, there was a guy, Derek Prince, who put out a book about praying for the country. Uh, people, uh, Derek Prince, Don Bashan, uh, uh, Bob Mumford and other people were all kind of united together under this thing that became called the shepherding movement. That's where things kind of got culty because everyone was, you were supposed to report in to the people above you and report about the people below you. <laughs> and who you married, uh, uh, what you did with your money. Um, uh, eventually I had to get my demons cast out of me, which I really regretted because I was like one of the last people in the group to do it. And about two months later, another kind of sister group uh, related to us got in trouble for just doing some wacky uh, exorcisms. And I just felt like, darn, I wish I had just <laughs> been away two months and I wouldn't have had to, you know, like vomit up everything I'd eaten since high school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I, meanwhile, was reading like, uh, you know, I discovered G.K. Chesterton. I was reading the, uh, the literary criticism and historical uh, writings of uh, C.S. Lewis. Like, that was really an eye opener. Um, I had discovered Solzhenitsyn. Someone had mentioned him. He seemed important. And suddenly I found myself wading into the Gulag Archipelago uh, with, with Gusto. And there were three volumes. In the, and I remember waiting for the third one to come out in about 1980 or so. But I was just like you know, eating those up, especially once I figured out he was, he was a Christian. And what's interesting is that uh, no one could cr criticize me. I was reading like classic literature and Christian, really important Christian stuff. And no one could criticize me for what I was reading within the group. We weren't that crazy. But soon I found myself not really being able to communicate. I had a lot more going on in my head than anyone seemed to want to talk about. So, I mean, I got so desperate that one of the elders of the group told me to, uh, he, he, God had showed him I was going to be a missionary in Mexico. And I just said, 
okay. <laughs> you know, just like random, <laughs> you know, I had no interest in Mexico apart from eating good tacos and burritos prior to that. And, uh, and I even went through and started doing a bit of Spanish language training, did, took some more, uh, university classes. Uh, um, and uh, basically, I'm sitting here reading the Gulag Archipelago, and I'm reading this stuff about communism and what it does to your minds, and I'm looking at our group thinking, and then I'm saying, why do I want to go to Mexico? Now, meanwhile, I had discovered Schaefer. And uh, I, one thing is I don't think Schaefer is the greatest writer in the world. That is to say, his prose is, is functional. It's not like C.S. Lewis's that you really remember the turn of phrase. However, he was the only person at the time that I knew of in any kind of evangelical kind of uh, world that was discussing art and culture. And in 1977, at the beginning of the year, Francis Schaeffer, uh, Frankie, he was, he's now Frank Schaeffer, uh, Edith uh, came through on a seminar tour showing parts of their film, How Should We Then Live? And someone gave me free tickets to it. They gave me free tickets because they had used uh, some, when they were shooting, they used our street and we helped them out. So they gave us a few tickets. So someone said, Vern, do you want to go? I said, yeah. So yeah, it sounded interesting. So uh, I went, and that really had a big effect on me. Uh, and particularly, uh, the films had a, an effect. And I think the film, those are the only films of Schaefer's I still recommend to anyone. Because they're kind of funky, and the funkiness works. Because they're not super uh, commercialized. I think by the time they did Whatever Happened to the Human Race, that our, Frankie took over that one, and he was already dipping into the propaganda bag. Um, and he was, you know, using uh, thousands of little uh, uh, baby dolls on the Dead Sea to demonstrate uh, saline abortions and things like this. And my feeling is like, and the music itself was like sappy. And, I, and, and even then I was a little bit like, felt a little bit off about that. But anyway, that was, uh, that, was uh, that. But actually... The, the lecture Frankie gave at that uh, seminar was really affected me because he talked about how Christian, <laughs> that's ironic now, how Christians had given into propaganda and made utilitarian messages out of their art. <laughs> that, is, that is enormously, I just listened to the Frankie's Google talk and it's like, oh. <laughs> That was their message until they began to do the propaganda. It's like like talking well, yeah. to my friend Nick in yeah. Santa Cruz who, you know, oh, let's, you know, they're all against cults. Oh, let's start our own. Um, well, there is a tension right there. Right. Bye. I'm still here. I got to get my. Gotta there get is a tension right there. Here, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's pretty warm here, but it's nighttime. So, <laughs> um there is a tension right there, and this, uh, and it's it essentially, I think Frankie used Frank used his guilt that because of the way he was brought up, uh, I, because Labrie became such a hot spot, some of his childhood was kind of left on the wayside, and and so he was able to press these buttons, get Dad to make these films. Like I say, the first one that he was didn't fully direct. Is the best one because it is the most honest uh, version of Francis Schaeffer's ideas. Whereas eventually, you know, the things that come after that feel more and more propagandistic. And it's not Schaeffer himself doing it. It's, it's Frankie pushing him towards, you know. And part of it was, unfortunately, uh, Frankie was making a living off of this stuff. Making a living changes how you approach things. Yeah, it does. and I, I actually spent quite a while talking to him during those days and I could already sense that he didn't have any love for the basic evangelical world at that time uh, he was seeing it at that point through the, the Labrie glasses uh, which is to say he was seeing their hypocrisy and such through 
through through an understanding that might have been gleaned from people like well his father but Os Guinness or uh, Donald Drew was an English uh, teacher who came through Libri. Uh, Rookmacher definitely influenced him. Particularly Rookmacher influenced him on his ideas about art. It's he didn't go all the way though. And unfortunately, around that same time, Rookmacher passed away at the beginning of 1977, which I deeply regret because of all the thinkers of Libri, he's the one that really, all his, uh, I read his books, but more importantly, his lectures, which can be found on the Libri Ideas Library. Uh, there's a website called that, and you can find most of, of, uh, uh, every, most of Rookmacher's stuff there. Anyway, I had gotten uh, this whole, meanwhile, this whole, uh, um, what was it, uh, thing with being a missionary to Mexico. And, and I was sitting there going, you know, I'm really interested in what's happening in Europe and communism and, and the gulags and all this. And I'm sure Mexico's a great place. And uh, I was certainly getting more interested in the culture, but I didn't have any particular burden for it. So I went up to the team leader. They had happened to move me to a less strict part of the church, another town. Uh, where the people kind of like looked at the Christian communes less as being like a, uh, an organizational discipline uh, structure and more as being kind of like people just hanging out and living together and not really watching each other. So it wasn't quite as strict in this particular locale. So I started going to movies at that time and watching movies, thinking about things. I'd watch movies like Taxi Driver. I won't go into my first uh, view of that, but that essentially was like, Someone put a gun to my head and said, do you think you can communicate your faith at all anymore? Look at this. And the answer was no. And, uh, and, and why? It's because we look like him. We look like the taxi driver. We're going crazy because we think life is full of me. And that's how they're going to look at me. And I sat, well, when I first saw that movie, I sat there and just, and I said, oh, I just got put in check. <laughs> you know, they just got me. Because I realized we used, you know, what we had developed had come out of the hippie era, but things had radically changed. And so, but I'd already started listening to punk rock. I'd already started uh, trying to understand uh, what was going on in uh, film uh, and 70s film was particularly weighty and interesting, but also very dark and pessimistic often. And when I, I told the team leader, I don't want to go to Mexico. I don't think God's calling me. I used the right phrase. I don't think God's calling me to go to Mexico. And he immediately said, oh, okay. And suddenly I was left with to do. And my dear mother said, what about that Labrie place you've been talking about? And I said, huh, how would I even get there? And I talked to someone who knew something. And then I went and worked in Glacier National Park in Montana for a summer. Uh, and then I went. Uh, not before being kind of uh, uh, put down by the team leader saying, you shouldn't go to Labri because, not the team leader, but the, the pastor, the main pastor, because when people come back, they don't want to do evangelism anymore. Well, I found out why when I got there is because they did, Labri doesn't do, uh, you know, that kind of street kind of evangelism, nor does it do the invitational sermon evangelism. They more just like, be a Christian, talk about things, you know, hey, if you discover it's true, it's true, you, you discover it. And who knows, dear Christian brother and sister, you also may discover you're not a Christian at Libri. Hmm. So anyway, so I arrived there in October of 1978. 75, uh, you said? 78. 78, okay. Yeah. And... Uh, Schaefer was not there when I arrived. He just they just fin finished filming oh, whatever happened to the human race, and he had been diagnosed with lymphoma, so he was off in Rochester, Minnesota. So meanwhile, I was uh, kind of sent over to French Libri, which was across the lake at that time from Swiss Libri, and I got to come over to Swiss Libri every now and then. But uh, they gave me uh, these lectures to listen to, particularly rec lectures by Ruckmacher, but Schaefer and all these other people, Os Guinness and many, many other people, and books to read. And I had a tutor to talk with, and I was supposed to do half a day of work. And what happened to me was at a certain point in late November, the Jonestown incident occurred where 
Almost a thousand people died of suicide in the jungles of Guyana. I had run into some of these people before. I had met a man who had lost his son in the uh, Ukiah uh, Jonestown camp. Um, and so this hit me really hard. And I, 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 you know, what's funny is I'd spent a lot of time thinking about cults prior to this because we used to try to go into cults and rescue, pe rescue people, which is really ironic too. But then again, this is the kind of life we live where I was just thinking today of how much harm is done by people who claim to know what love is, you know? So whether it's the SJWs or Christians or, uh, you know, I'm sure people in almost every religion, the people who know the most about exactly what love is, get in the most trouble because we should tread carefully on those kinds of subjects and admit how, how much our motives are mixed up. Uh, thank you, Jordan Peterson. So, <laughs> um, but, uh, so what happened was there was a French woman, I lived in this small French village and there was a French woman who lived next door and she was an atheist and a communist as many French people were. And she came over and she asked us, she said, is this place, uh, she'd heard about this place, Jamestown or something. I said, Jim Jones, Jonestown. And then the news started coming in and we were all horrified. But the French woman asked a question that I, I couldn't shake off. What makes you different than them? And I looked around at Labrie and I realized that uh, it was, they were actually telling me things that were telling me to question what I was learning. You know, I mean, you couldn't listen to Rookmacher lectures and walk away at all comfortable in what you believed. You know, he just simply wouldn't let, let you. Schaefer himself was not a person to let, you know, uh, people just kind of comfortably believe whatever they believed. It's just like, why do you? If you don't have a good reason. And once I got a, a kind of say arrested when I was trying to give a glib definition of faith during a lecture and my very good friend uh, John Sandry who's alive now he's in his early 80s uh, he was giving a lecture he, he doesn't even remember this last time I talked to him he goes, oh really you know but for me this was like a huge moment I had said something about you know faith is the assurance of things not seen blah 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 and you know you just believe and all this stuff and, and he says really where did you get that idea you know, it was like, well, I got it out of the Bible. <laughs> yeah, except he, he pointed out that, you know, you don't just believe because you believe. There has to be reasons for why you believe what you believe. And uh, this is a complicated subject, but, but that was an arresting moment. But this, the Jonestown thing, this was huge. So I said, well, okay, Labrie is not like this. They're really teaching me the question, even them. And then I applied the same question back, back home in California. And I just felt the bridge collapse behind me mm. because I knew. And by the end of, uh, I, I couldn't go back. So I spent almost a year there and I wasn't even legally there after a while. I was just hiding out in Switzerland from the gendarmes and the French section. And, and uh, you know, I just couldn't go home. I wasn't even I, uh, officially a Labrie worker or helper or anything. I was just in the area, keep coming back and forth, eating meals and talking and stuff because I couldn't go. At that time, Labrie was huge. There might be between 100 and 150 people passing through in any given moment in the summer, whereas now it's capped off around 35 max. It's often between 20 and 30. Um, but... Uh, I, uh, I started getting, eventually started getting letters from people back home saying, burn, what's, why aren't you coming back? And, uh, you know, and then people saying, like, well, you always did kind of live in your own private fantasy world. And I said, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, and there were a couple of people who started saying things, you know, it's just, uh, and I just very courageously wrote back saying, well, this is exactly the reason why it is because we became too involved with each other and think we know what is best for each other at all times when often we don't. So I stuck around there for a year, went back, and, and I made up my mind at that point that I would eventually go to New York City. I had started, the thing I had got, Schaefer eventually came back. I eventually uh, spent a little bit of time, not a whole lot, talking to him. And I had realized that I was very interested in music history. Uh, I'd, I'd been kind of sneaking punk rock cassettes into this uh, job I was working at with a little cassette recorder uh, player, you know. 
Um, and, but I felt like, no, we don't need another little book, you know, written by Christians about the problems with rock music. You know, we don't need that. We need decent scholarship on the subject. So I said, I'm going to go to New York City, which is kind of a, my, my feeling told me it was kind of the heart of everything. And I think I was right for that period. I ended up going there in 1980. But I mu once talked to Schaefer and I said, you know, if I boil, do boil down everything you've ever written about music, yeah, I get about three pages worth. You didn't mean that to be any sort of final statement on anything, did you? And he goes, no, absolutely. So I said to him, so I'm going to go and I'm going to work on the subject in depth, particularly trying to understand what happened in the 20th century with music, uh, all the different forms, particularly the American forms, but which had such an effect throughout the world. I, that was my goal. So that's why I went to New York. So anyway, that's another story. So. Interestingly, though, the tensions of Libri were starting then. And so, um, uh, and it was exactly, I was with uh, the Schaefer's and uh, as they were traveling and going on the next seminar for how should, uh, no, whatever happened to the human race. And things were different then. And it started to feel more propagandistic. And I kind of wondered about it. But they just kept going that direction. And my feeling is it was Frankie pushing dad along that tra trail. And I'm sure that there were times when Francis just was like, you know, what am I doing? You know, and near the end, he kind of just, I think, got off that train, particularly because his health made him. But, but I think he just lost heart in that kind of pro uh, process. And unfortunately, the damage was done so that when he passed away, I think there was a Newsweek article on him that called him the guru uh, of the new right uh, to the evangelicals and such. And I think he would have been horrified to have been classified like that. I think always he would have been horrified to have been classified. Because when you were there, um, Schaefer and uh, other people at Labrie, I mean, any, any topic was on the table. You know, if someone came in and wanted to talk about Satanism, if someone wanted to come talk about why shouldn't I commit suicide today, if someone wanted to talk about, uh, uh, I brought up a couple of subjects, which no one, I was proud of myself because I brought up a couple of subjects no one had seemed to discuss. One of them was, uh, what about comedy? <laughs> Let's discuss comedy. And I've had an active interest in comedy ever since. Uh, but but uh, no, it was like Schaefer was always pointing at art and pointing at culture. And, and he felt very deeply about the sorrow that a person with an existentialist worldview would have to feel living in a world of such absurdity. And because that is how the French existentialists saw the world. And in fact, Schaefer went through a period in the early, I believe it was the very early 1950s where they, they were already in Switzerland. They went over there in 1948. They met Ruckmacher, Hans Ruckmacher at that time, and Ruckmacher became involved. I think Ruckmacher already started to also have an effect on him. Ruckmacher had become a Christian in some sort of prisoner of war camp in uh, World War II. And uh, uh, Ruckmacher was a very unlikely convert. And as soon as he, he became a Christian, and then he said, I went into the church, and I have never gotten over what I saw in the churches <laughs> <laughs> because it was not, you know, and, and Rookmarker made it very clear. It's just like, well, something's wrong here. Uh, but Rookmarker was also brilliant on the subject of art. But I think uh, Schaefer in, in the early 1950s basically said to Edith one day, I can't go on this way. He'd been going along. He was a preception presuppositional apologist following uh, Cornelius Van Til, uh, whom you will know, but yeah. no one else, <laughs> a few uh, people a might few know. The, a few of the but, listeners will know who Van Til is. Yeah, but basically what happened was, uh, he said, I've got to rethink what, why I believe what I believe. And he says, I can't come, I, I'm going to go off, I'm going to go hiking and wandering through, just think about things. And he told Edith Schaefer and the family, I said, I can't promise I'm going to come back a Christian when this is all done. And so he was very honest and, and he went through what he believed. Why did he believe it? What was absurd? What was not? 
Uh, I understand that because after being at, at Labrie, I went through a similar process and got rid of certain parts of uh, that I just felt were somehow corruptions that had landed on my faith. Um, but that's what Labrie comes out of. That and also Edith Schaefer's work, which was very important as well. But it was the honesty of trying to wrestle with things. And I think that's where the, the Peterson connection is. Uh, is that both of them are honest to the point of uh, genuine emotion. You know, both of them will ask uh, genuine questions and will take any question that comes to them. Both of them will emphasize the importance of learning and reading. And, and I think those kinds of things, I hate to say it, but for everyone in this, who lives in this world, it's like a, a desperate drink of water that people don't get enough of. Yeah. And you can see that with the Peterson. It's just like someone says, yeah, you can think. There is a point to life. Try to think about it. And it's just like thirsty people are just sitting there. And, and Schaefer had a similar effect. Yeah. The 80s at Labrie was, uh, in, particularly in Switzerland, there were different Labries by this time, but the 80s was a rough period. I visited in a, the second time in 1987. I quite frankly didn't think they'd be there when I got back in 1990. I, I eventually showed up in 1993 again, and they were good. And they'd gone through some, some changes, uh, particularly Swiss Libri. Uh, but, and, and since then they have more or less uh, continued to serve their function and they've gone through good times and bad times. But, but, uh, they have. When I go back there, I often am left with the feeling that no, Labrie really still serves a function, particularly Swiss Labrie. I've gone to the Rochester Labrie, and I know some of the people from the other Labries, and I'm sure they serve a function too. But Swiss Labrie really, I think, is there as a place where people can wrestle with ideas, whether Christians or not. And uh, I recommend people go there. And they've just gone through another kind of change and things. When I went there in, what was it, 20, 2016? Yeah. Um, yeah, because I was there in 2012, and the next time was 2016. That was the time when I also started to have worries. And the reason was is they started to get the really politically correct students there. And... It, it was rough because they were, they were the kind of people who felt, you could tell there was a kind of a self-righteousness that got kind of spread in and that prickly offense, you know, don't offend me kind of thing. Yeah. But I'm happy to report that my next two trips, uh, 2017 and 2018, uh, yeah, they're back on track, you know, and, and uh, they've kind of swept the cobwebs a bit there and uh, things are going well. So anyway, there you have that. Well, that's, that's, that's really helpful. I, we just had a, we had a meetup, we had a meetup Sunday night here and we had a new person in for the meetup and I had a conversation. We always have our regular meetup, which is about two hours and we have the after hours, which is people break up into smaller conversations and we just keep talking right. until I have to kick everybody out. Otherwise, otherwise right. we right. have Labrie in Sacramento and I'm not ready to start that. Um, yes, yes. But, but, what, what you said is, I mean, this, this is what struck this individual who came. He said, you know, you, well, it's in a church and you're doing this, but we're, we're talking, we're having honest conversations and people aren't, you know, in the, the people aren't bullshitting each other. This isn't mm -hmm. propaganda. And, you know, I know some, sometimes people in the church have get a little uncomfortable with this, not this church, but you mm -hmm. know, the church generally. And I, you know, I'm just, I'm grateful for a place like that. Now, it's, it's really interesting what you said, though, about the dynamics between Frankie and Francis in terms of, because listening to Frankie's Google Talk, which is easy to find, obviously, it's, it sounds like that's, you know, the, it's the money. I mean, Frankie talked about that. It, it's the money and the influence and the, I mean, that, we, we should never underestimate how that affects us if you have if you have a million people applauding you and cheering you for a particular thing that you're doing you know it's like the old psychological experiment where the kids smile every time the teacher 
turns, you know, makes a step to mm-hmm. the left and you just keep smiling that teacher all the way over into the corner. I mean, in a mass scale, this is what attention, status, money, influence, fame, this is what this does to us. And mm-hmm. so I, mm-hmm. I, I really liked your comment about this, you know, this kind of this, this narrow edge between this openness that they had and then the propaganda because you know that, that we're, we've got this deep hunger for openness to you know can I explore but then then in a sense that openness itself can become propaganda and that's when of course it's lost again so I that right. and we're... it's easy for anyone to lose it yes and 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 part of the problem is this and I can see this happening with Frank he had uh, several children at a young age, got married young. He was supporting himself with first his paintings and then his films. Now you don't want to upset the apple cart. So you keep doing and saying the things that will keep the uh, bread you need for your family coming in. Yeah. And that's the problem yeah. is right there. Yeah. Um, and you know, what can I say? It's like, it's difficult. I mean, I've never quite had that problem because I've always been like on the uh, uh, poor side of the fence. And, uh, you know, Lord, bless me with this temptation. <laughs> yeah, you can't do it. But, uh, but no, it's, it, but at the same time, I've done things that have, you know, caused me to lose jobs and stuff because I, you know, did the wrong thing for the right reason or the right thing for the wrong reason. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's, it's complicated, uh, these things. And I think the temptation, once you start a system, I think Peterson is, is tempted by these things uh, to just simply, now you've got a, a bullhorn and people are listening. And now I think Peterson's probably got enough money to uh, uh, you know, survive for the rest of his life. So that's not an issue. But what happens when you start getting the ideas for this institution or that place and such, that's where the temptations start to come, you know? So I think that, you know, I just say, you know, uh, I'm grateful I've never had to face that in that kind of a way. But at the same time, I've often, the reason I haven't made a lot of money is because, hey, I could have made a lot of money doing rock record reviews back in the 80s, 90s, whatever. Or, you know, because I'm good. Uh, I know my stuff. But I I said, yeah, but I watch well how these people end up writing. And they use the same language. And then the, and the editors and the publishers, they want the same kind of things. And I can't do that. So I, and at a certain point, I said to myself, I'm going to understand the music. But it's not going to be about, uh, you know, trying to get into the industry and be an insider. It's going to be more honest work. Uh, trying to understand these things. And that's how I looked at puppetry as well. I'm both an insider and an outsider, you know, so and it's, it's not about making money. It's about exploration. Um, I mean, there have been plenty of things I could have done to sell myself, but uh, I'm more about the exploration. And and having come across the ideas of Jacques Ellul about propaganda, that almost, I'm, I'm so aware of it all the time that I'm just very much aware that, you know, challenge what I say, don't believe everything I say. A real conversation, uh, Elul said once, where discussion begins, propaganda ends. Real human discussion, and you can't be a propagandist in that form. But I've had discuss- talks with people who are propagandized, and, and what happens is, uh, and, and they can be any kind of people. You'll be talking to them and there's a click you can almost hear it, where they just suddenly start going off into what they're doing. I mean, Christians do it when suddenly they click, and now I'm trying to get you saved. Yep, yep, you know, yep, yep, um, yep. and they cease to deal with each individual, and and they start worrying about, well, this is going too slow. We're not reaching enough people. You know, and uh, one of the big uh, the hallmarks of the technological society, according to Jacques Ellul, is efficiency. And the more we seek to be efficient, the less human we become. Because you have to, you know, McDonald's sells a lot of hamburgers, but are those really good hamburgers? 
they're just they you know they have taste they they but they don't have substance the substance of a decent hamburger that i would make you know? <laughs> <laughs> no i i love you know i i'm so oh there's so many things i want to talk to you about you know because i watched i i think a, it so when you told me you know you were in not the state of Georgia, but the country of Georgia, and you were interested in puppets. And then I watched some of your videos, and I watched your video on texture. I thought that was that was so helpful. And you know, I I talked to a guy yesterday, and we'll probably depends on if he wants to release the conversation. But but one of one of the things that he said, he's, he release said, the release the conversation. <laughs> only, if he, only if he says yes. People yeah, have people have things to lose. Um, but. You know, it's it, one of the things he commented. He said, "You know, I, I see it. I see it in YouTube in terms of once people once people get a certain size, you know." And I think it's exactly that situation. And as a pastor in a church, you deal with that all the time because, mm -hmm. on one hand, you're supposed to you, the institution says you're supposed to speak, preach prophetically from the Word of God, and that's supposed to unnerve us and disrupt us and change us and transform us. On the other hand. The people that you're talking to are the ones that are supporting, the ones that are putting checks in the plate. And if you tick off some of those people, and in the 80-20 rule, 20% of the people are putting 80% of the money in, you tick those people off, well, it and and it slowly becomes propaganda. And I so so in terms of my little channel, I I'm, I'm always thinking about this in terms of you know, for a while I was watching metrics a lot and because I just kind of want to figure out how the YouTube thing works. Sure. So I There's uh, Social Blade is this program where you can compare like five channels and, you know, watch how many new subs they get each day and you can see how many views they're getting. And so I'm, I'm thinking about this and, and then I'm thinking, okay, well, well, what, what, what exactly is my channel about? What, what am I doing on YouTube? What, what, what is this for? And should I be... You know, I very quickly realized that when I talk to people who have fame, I get way more subscribers. Just boom, you get this big hit. But then it's oh, about, yeah. well, that's what everybody does with their YouTube channel. Get right. the bigger well, to talk to, and 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 then I thought, and if, you're, and if you're honest, you you must know that the word Jordan Peterson drives more people to you. Well, I I never would have. Nobody would ever watch my channel if I hadn't started talking about exactly. Jordan Peterson. Exactly. So, so then I, oh, I, I mean, I think about this stuff and it's like, oh, I'm conflicted about the whole business. And then sometimes I think, ah, I'm not going to make any more videos. And then, and then someone says, oh, Paul, thank you for making videos. You've really helped me. And that's like, ah, uh. so, you know, it's, but this, this, these temptations, you know, this stuff is real. And oh, yeah. I, Oh, I, I love I love your story because it has so many of these dynamics in there. And you know, are we you got the Jones? short version? <laughs> I know I got the short there's version. A, a little there's longer. a lot you know, more. And I want you to I, I you know, you're making your channel keep telling your story because I think Yeah, well eventually I will get more personal. Right now I will occasionally bring in things, but um uh yeah. A part of the reason I'm doing the channel is because I do have I have a lot of ideas I need to write about and do things about, but I'm also very slow at it. So I've got, you know, my writing is over on the Anadromous Life uh, essay site. We'll call it. That's a blog. And uh, so. That's not very sexy. Uh, and, get, and I'm very That's serious about stuff. But I'm, I realize how slow I am at getting to things. I, I mean, most of what I've written there is not even the stuff I am mostly interested in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've written, I, it's often things I'm discovering, like Georgia, which I am very interested in, enough to live here, or American uh, Gothic culture, not to be confused with goth, or, uh, you know, these other things that kind of come, propaganda, well, that's important to me, but I haven't hardly written about music at all. I do have a whole other site for puppetry, but even that's more exploration than my ideas about puppetry. Um, and then there are big ideas, like my ideas about time and I've been working on that for a long time and uh, I've found it interesting that you have been uh, diving more into the subject of meaning uh, in the last few months and that is really crucial to me and that's been something I have been working with for a long time uh, and I really it was Rookmacher's lecture which can be found at the uh, Libri Ideas Library on reality that is 
one of the things that really kicked it off uh, because he talks, he at one point says, I used to say that reality is fact plus meaning. But he says, what are facts? It's, it's at best a little scientific, you know, thing. Reality is meaning, you know. Yeah. And now I would say I, I would take a little bit more of a nuance there and talk about some other things, but I, I, I think he's basically right. And um, so for me, it, it, I followed the breadcrumbs he laid down there. And some of the breadcrumbs are, well, he mentioned C.S. Lewis as the discarded image. I had already read, got that breadcrumb by the time I found his lecture, which that lecture I have listened to, I figured it out the other day about at least 40 times since I first heard it, because I keep finding more in it. And Rick Marker is also a really interesting speaker and sometimes really funny. Uh, there's also a four part series of him talking about art which I highly recommend because he has a whole section in there. He talks about how you can recognize art, but he's got a whole section where he starts talking about nudity and art. And you can feel the Christians in the audience. And it was like, I think Westminster Seminary. And this was like 1976. Their backs just, you can feel everything tensing up. And then there's some woman there who's an early uh, Christian feminist. And then there's some other people talking about, you know, pornography and stuff. And Rich Marker finally says, you Americans are so stupid. Why do you, you know, just, I, it's, I love it. They left some of that out of the uh, complete works of Rookmarker. I have that edited by his daughter, uh, Marlene, who, who uh, I've met, she's wonderful, but she left out the, some of the parts I love the most, which was him just like blowing up. <laughs> he's, and, but he, uh, uh, but he, the, he then mentions Barfield several times. And Barfield is quite amazing. There is a quote I love from Barfield that's in uh, one of his essays in the book, The Rediscovery of Meaning, which is a series of essays. Now, not every essay in there is worth reading, but some of them really are. And in one place, he talks about that we have this problem because we have become these individuals in a certain solitary sense. And to the degree that we are individual, we are also alienated and isolated from each other. So, and you can really, now he wrote that probably back in the 60s. You can really see it now. Technology has made us more individualistic than ever. Everyone has you know, got a t-shirt that says, I'm this. They've got tattoos that say, I'm that. They, they're all trying to say there's something. And yet they are more individual and isolated and alienated from each other all the time. Um, but Barfield's uh, Saving the Appearances, I read that book. The first time I read that, it was like, oh, that was difficult. But not nearly as difficult as his, his book on Coleridge, which I read, which took me about, I don't know, four months to get through. I stopped and read Einstein's Theory of Relativity in the middle for a break to tell you how <laughs> difficult that book was. <laughs> and he talks about the subject of polarities and all this other stuff. It's just really complex writing. Um, but then uh, uh, he also mentions uh, other interpretations. Oh, one of the great things about uh, Rookmacher's uh, art lectures is uh, he has a whole section where he talks about the meaning of scholarship and how we can understand anybody. And, and he, he, he has four points that are really interesting, but I would suggest going to the Libri Ideas Library and hunting down some Rookmacher. They're old recordings from the 1970s and uh, they've cleaned them up, not, not to the best of my taste. Sometimes that you get that digital kind of plastic sound almost, but, but they're still uh, audible and uh, you know, the material in there is like gold. But um, I started, in a sense, I kept following people. So you know, through C.S. Lewis, I found G.K. Chesterton, but then I found uh, Barfield, but then I found, uh, you know, of course, Dorothy Sayers, Charles Williams, uh, Charles Williams' figure of Beatrice, amazing uh, discussion of the image of Beatrice in Dante's Inferno. Uh, absolutely, he's got another book on uh, the meaning of the city. These are our fantastic uh, works. Um, then I discovered, oh, Rookmacher mentions Michael Polanyi's uh, uh, personal knowledge. Now, personal knowledge to me, when it comes to taking Michael Polanyi was a chemist, 
a, he was a hardcore scientist, Hungarian. He ended up moving to, to uh, England, and uh, particularly during the communist period. Uh, he died, I believe, in around 64. Uh, but, and there are four lectures of him, audio only. If you type in Polanyi with, the, with MP3, after do a search, you can find his, his lectures. They are amazing because he talks about the nature of reality. And the thing that Polanyi says, and once I read this, I never had a problem with, uh, you, know, you know, scientists and Christianity and evolution again. And, and it was hard to tell exactly what his, his faith was, but he definitely had a faith, but he was very much the scientist. And, but he said, basically his thought was this, knowledge is personal. That means everyone's knowledge. That means the scientist who says that what he's doing is absolutely objective is not absolutely objective. But he also points out things like this. Where does the scientist get their ideas? Where does the hypothesis come from? The hypothesis does not come from the substances. It doesn't come from matter. It doesn't come from simply, it comes just pops into your head, looking at something and you interact with it. And suddenly you get a, I wonder why, you know, are there any colors besides the three primary colors and all their friends? You know, uh, these kind of questions. Uh, but no, uh, personal knowledge is another very difficult book. He's got equations in there. It's just like, it's, but one, and then he's got several other books, uh, The Logic of Liberty and, and, and The Tactile Dimension. Uh, these are all great. What happens when I discover someone, I just, okay, we're going all the way down. And, uh, and, but Polanyi is uh, monumental when it comes to the idea of meaning. And it's particularly if you put them, and then there's Elul, who Os Guinness mentioned a lot back in the 1960s and 70s. And Elul is a totally different beast entirely because he is French, very logical French. And the French, when they get into rigor, the rigor of their logic, it's just like, whoa, watch out for these guys. They're not like they're flimsy. Um, and, and he's got his sociological writing, the technological society, the technological system, the technological bluff, the political illusion, a particularly scary book that remains relevant, and uh, how he basically said, and propaganda, the formation of men's attitudes. And when you put, particularly the first three that kind of were a trilogy were technological system, propaganda, and the political illusion. And you suddenly, once you got to the political illusion, you said, oh, George Carlin was right. They just shuffle the faces around. <laughs> you know, it's not about conspiracy theories. It's about hardcore knowledge and, and understanding. And um, I could go on for that. But then there's Walker Percy. Walker Percy is interesting because, well, uh, the most accessible book by him is Lost in the Cosmos, yeah. which is his parody of a self-help book. Yes. Yes. And it's wonderful. Yes. But his, uh, his book of essays, Lost in the Cosmos, is really great. Re particularly his one called, uh, what is it? Uh, the Loss of the Creature. And he talks about how we've lost our things. And it goes perfectly with, I mean, uh, Elul talks about the whole, how technology ca causes us to lose meaning and such. And in fact, Elul has a very interesting point. He says that technology, okay, he says our first, the first environment that humans grew up in, in, in history, was nature, the natural world. But we get everything good from there. So we get the sun, we get, uh, you know, rain, waters our crops, we get, you know, food from the animals and, and uh, you know, nature is, you know, everything, it seems, except it also provides all the worst things as well. So that sun can destroy you if you don't get enough water. Rain can destroy you. Weather can destroy you. Animals can destroy you. The sea can destroy you. All aspects of nature can kind of get revenge. And in order to fight that, we created the second environment. And the second environment, he says, and this is all in the technological system. The second environment is society, the social world. And so what we have in the, the second environment is we have, okay, we've banded together in cities. We've learned to, you know, crop rotation. We've learned how to plant, uh, harvest in the fields. We've got, you know, things are, uh, but, so that we're protected from some of the worst ravages of nature. Not always, but often enough. But then he says, 
uh, we have, um, what is it, uh, all the problems that come with the social world, which uh, range from the problems of love and all the things related to, you know, the heartaches of love and back and forth and too many people and everyone wanting the same people and whatnot, to the problems of war and disease. And disease is spread, particularly when you get a lot of people in proximity. And war basically will take us out. And so we've been slowly working at creating the, the environment we now live in, which is technology. And he says, we live inside of technology. It's not a question of being against technology. You can't be. The, everything you do now is through technology. And he was writing this in the 1960s. Yeah. When his last book, The Technological Bluff, uh, he wrote in the 1980s. He died around, what, 86, 87? Uh, interestingly enough, C.S. Lewis died on the day that JFK was shot. Right. And Bill Lowell died on the day that Jackie Kennedy died. Really? I didn't know that. An interesting little <laughs> coincidence. Um, but the interesting thing is we are still in the process, we, you know, of finding out what the damage is from our technological world, particularly the shift into the internet and this collective hive mind. Right. And, uh, and ooh, <laughs> there's kind of like nothing else after that. In, in many ways to answer those questions. So my feeling is this, uh, putting all these together, plus uh, Tarkovsky's uh, writing, uh, Sculpture in Time, uh, Solzhenitsyn's work, uh, Dostoevsky, uh, I mean, there's lots more people, I'm just cherry picking at the moment. But is that essentially we are at war with reality. We're, we want a perfect world, and the more we try to get there, the more we are putting the gun to our head. There's an interesting line in T.S. Eliot's uh, Four Quartets where he says, we'll finally come back. I, I'm not quoting this exactly, but he says it near the end of the, the whole poem cycle. He says, like, the, the last place will be the first place. In other words, it's almost like this picture of returning to the Garden of Eden. And I thought about that for a while, and I said, yeah. And you know what will happen when we get to the Garden of Eden? We're going to finally find out what the sword was that the angel had. Hmm. It's the thing that won't allow us to become perfect, that won't allow us to know everything, that won't allow us to, to get back to the garden. And, and I think it's, it's real. I don't know what it is, but there's something within humanity that, that sword is keeping us from ever going that way back. Uh, but that is, I think, one of the central temptations of humanity. If you look at uh, uh, fascism or communism, you know, the idea of a perfect society. But even today, there are ideas of a perfect society, whether the ideal free market or the ideal uh, social justice or, you know, the ideal Islamic state or the ideal Christian you know, if we can only get America back to being a perfect Christian, you know, it, you know, it never was, it never will be. And if you were a good enough Christian, you would know that and stop sucking at the uh, perfection straw. You know? <laughs> well, this was wonderful. I love that's a that's a that's a that's a I, I took a lot of notes. I'm glad we got it recorded. That's a great. That's a great. Yeah, we didn't even get to talking about we texture. Didn't talk about texture, but I, I got it. You know, I got. I want to touch on that just briefly. I know we should wrap up, but mm, I whatever. had never. So I was listening to that talk that you gave at Labrie, and I had never thought about the fact that we we think almost nothing. It's not that we don't think about it. We 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 don't think about it when we're thinking about things. But right. The, so so look at how much abstract. At, 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 I forget. I forget Verveke's word for using basically using the um, using the the brain mechanisms. For example, using Peterson talks about this too. Using the brain mechanisms for sight. For you know, I can close my eyes. I can imagine. I can foresee. I can plan. We, so we have all these visual metaphors. Well, feeling has become in our culture the 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 substitute for thought. I feel this. I feel this. I feel right, this. Right, right. And it trumps thought. It trumps emotional Trump. incontinence. What's that? <laughs> emotional incontinence. Yeah. yeah it, <laughs> and, and it, yeah. But, but it's 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 actually texture. So that's right. the that's the stuff that we're using as putting it at the top of our 
of our knowledge hierarchy right now. Well, I feel this to be true. All that intuition. I mean, one of the one of the things that one of the things that I heard, you know, part of what makes us amazing creatures is that we have so much feeling all over our bodies. Mm-hmm. And 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 I don't know if you know this, one of the people in my meetup showed me these there's this entire movement of there's an entire genre of videos and and internet channels where people have a microphone. Oh yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And they're all about it. And, and it's yeah. like ASMR. So yeah. Yeah, a- ASMR. I, I had never. I, I saw it, and and I was looking at, it and I was just, I was thinking, what on earth is this? But but yet somehow, yeah, and and no, and and so I, you know, I, and when you opened that up, I thought, well, here's a whole continent that I oh, yeah. never even thought of. And yeah. well, it's think about, important. you probably remember uh, when we were younger, they had those uh, sound effects records like uh, environments where you play just a forest in the background or yeah. something. Yeah. Of course, they have these kind of things on YouTube and whatnot, but that's because we're missing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. And, and the ironic thing is these days when we're missing some kind of texture, we tend to create plastic or digital imitations of it. Yes. Which is really weird, but that's where we are, <laughs> you know. Uh, by the way, besides the, the, the lecture there, on uh, there are three more lectures from Labrie on my first YouTube channel, The Anadromous Life. And one of them is uh, uh, my first puppet lecture there, which was uh, puppetry as an antidote art. And the other one was a history of puppetry. So obviously you should listen to the one on art first and don't bother with the other one unless you get interested in it. But then the third one is the uh, the propaganda and social media. And I've got some other works that are sitting around that I have to, I've got one that's probably the one that's the most, I'll probably get in the most trouble for it's called conceptual humanity. And it's about the fact that basically if, we no longer define ourselves as being in the image of God. And if everything natural can be supplanted by technology, and so it's just our choice, then is it any wonder that people are having their tongues split and their bodies tattooed, or they're getting a breast reduction or, uh, you know, breast surgery enhancement or, or, you know, when they're 16 years old, because there is no definition of the self. And so this is, but that lecture has so much visual material with it. I've got it all, and I'm just waiting to kind of put it all together. And there's other stuff too, I think. Yeah, I don't have my lectures on time. with me. I do have my lectures on images though, I think. So I'm gonna eventually get some of that stuff up and I might transfer the other ones to the other one, but it, it's good fodder. So, but yeah, no texture, it goes with meaning. It's like, what kind of world do we actually live in? Do we live in a world where for instance, you could live inside of a room that had, say, the, the texture of your, the average white refrigerator. Could you live in that world? You know, there's a lot of science fiction movies that show us living in that world. But the world we live in is a lot trashier than that. Yeah. It's almost like when you create that flat, hollow world, people then break out the spray paint cans. They have to deface it. They have to leave more garbage on the streets. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's just too nice. It's, yeah. and who wants to live in it? Yeah. You know, yeah. we, we want wood, we want stone, we want textures that have some sort of meaning to them. And that brings us to the point of what is the meaning of things? Well, is the meaning generated in myself exclusively or is the meaning already there? And I somehow can access it because I am part of the same matrix. Of meaning right and that's how I think because otherwise how could people discover the things they have within science if the patterns weren't already there yeah, yeah. and yeah. and these are not illusory patterns you know we can pre- predict these patterns to the degree that we can send someone we can send things to Jupiter <laughs> you know little objects to Jupiter to take pictures you know we can we can uh, determine uh, the structure of DNA with inside of ourselves. How, how can we do that if, if there is no meaning to these things? 
you know, and did the pattern just generate itself? I mean, there's questions of God here, but then there's questions of just simply, I think a lot of Christians, for instance, are practically atheists. That is to say, they live yes, yes, yes. in the same dead world. Uh, as long as they go to church on Sunday and get a few prayers in, listen to a pastor who is talking in such a way as to please people so that they will keep coming back and paying his bills, um, they're not going to raise too many questions. And, and in fact, the first time I ever raised any of these questions was in a, uh, I was getting licensed to preach through our, the church I was in prior to going to La Brea. And so I talked about certain things. And one of the things I talked about was the texture of refrigerators and the deadness of them. And people, the, the, the pastor came up to me and said, what are you talking about? <laughs> this isn't what you're supposed to say. <laughs> yeah, you're not supposed to talk about refrigerators in a sermon. What are you talking about? <laughs> so anyway, if you listen to the, uh, the whole uh, texture uh, lecture, then you can uh, find out why refrigerators might be a problem. <laughs> and what I like is they used to actually have wooden uh, uh, handles and doors and things yeah. back when they were had those curly yeah. round uh, cooling yeah. coolant on top. Those were really cool refrigerators. I wish they still looked like that. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but then well, chilled things like our modern refrigerators too. <laughs> well, now we've just got buttons and now we're putting screens on our refrigerators. You go to the oh, I know. Samsung refrigerator and it's a big screen yeah. and soon there'll yeah. be, it won't be a clear door. It'll be a, a big door with a screen the size of the door with cameras inside. So well, that's the weird thing is that, is that we are giving ourselves over more and more to the, to the algorithms, you know, that, that is our, our lives increasingly. What's nice about living in Georgia is I am free. It's like, yeah, there's some computer stuff here, but it is like, it, in a way, it feels like I've returned to the 70s, although not as chaotic, but plenty chaotic. And what, I mean, I am constantly banging my head when you know the electricity goes out or I lose my water or <laughs> someone doesn't understand what I'm saying or the traffic. And I just did a... a uh, drive for my first drive out of town in a rented car that's this weekend and tried to get up into the mountains but I chose like the weirdest road I could possibly find we didn't make it we ended up getting a flat tire it was wonderful you know <laughs> it's like yeah this is life you know trying to do things real things yeah. meeting people yeah. real people having real conversations listening yeah. to people who actually sing I mean I saw a uh, piano recital in a small room a museum room last week or about a week and a half ago it was just like, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. The pianist was so good. And you could just see her as she was, it was like, yeah, she'd practice uh, these pieces by Liszt or Scriabin or, or uh, these other composers over and over and over again. And she had forgotten it all. And it was, it was like playing it for the first time. And you could just sense that. And I said, like, that is music. There's no microphone here. There's nothing between me and the music. Some old technology in the piano, but this is real. This is this is why I'm in Georgia, and we can talk about that sometime. So. Well, I shouldn't keep you up all night because I know it's it's late morning here, but it's late. It's getting late night for you, so um, yeah, eventually, yeah. But, but well, I've appreciated is... talking, and we will talk again. I'm I'm sure there is more to discuss. <laughs> I'm there, I'm sure there is. So hang on, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna stop the recording, and 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 we can, and we will see each other again. Okay.